in this absolutely nutso 2024 Supercross season. In the seventh round of the championship, the most unprecedented thing yet in an ever unpredictable series is that still more storylines have emerged, with very few having been resolved. First and foremost, the one two punch of Star Yamaha. Though they've certainly sown shared podiums and even sweeps with their 250 team before, for the first time, Bobby Reagan and Jeremy Coker's crew captured the top two steps of the podium of a premier class main event. As to the still emerging stories of the season, one might be inclined to give the nod to Cooper Webb for winning his sixth Arlington main event in 10 starts and becoming only the second rider to win two races in 24, after tracking down the other, Jet Lawrence. The wily Cooper Webb, chasing down and snatching victory from the team Honda rider many consider the fastest in the world at a Dallas race that changes the complexion of the championship. Shades of 2019, anyone? But no, the stars at night are bigger and brighter in Texas. And the biggest story from Dallas was the first sighting in almost a year, and something we wondered if we would see again. The reemergence of Beast Mode, Eli Tomac. After an early crash, Tomac circulated the second lap in just 16th place, and it seemed like more riding on the wall for the closing chapter of his career. But no, but wait. Like a grizzly, awakening from hibernation, the beast was back. Tomac steadily climbed the ladder, consistently running as much as two seconds faster than anyone in the field in the latter half of the race. That Jet had yet another rookie mistake was no real shocker. Nor should Tomac's ascendance really come as a surprise either. But it kind of was. Last week, this pundit opined that Daytona might be the turnaround point for Eli's season. Scratch that. We've already seen it on Saturday night in Dallas. Daytona is where he'll stamp it. I'm just I'm sick of people calling me the old guy, so uh, I'm just warming up. I'm getting better. I'm coming, so I'm ready to get going, and uh, yeah, second will do for tonight. Congratulations. You know what's next, Daytona. Refocusing on the actual race winner, Cooper's Arlington race has so often served as his own turnaround point in the season. And so it was again. From 10 points back and fourth in the championship chase to just three points out of the lead. This unusually rough, rutted, and sticky Dallas track may well serve as a precursor to what Cooper could do on the actual East Coast. Aaron Plessinger was back on the podium, and it was a little bit of a gift. But Aaron fought for the win with Eli in his heat race, and continues to prove that he has elevated his game to the truly elite level. Hunter Lawrence scored his second successive fifth place finish, and we have brothers in the top five in a second successive week, and for only the second time in the history of Supercross. For a time, early in the race, with Jed out front and Hunter holding sway in third, it appeared possible that we'd have our first ever podium shared by two brothers in the premier class. Of course, in the end, Jet's mistakes kept him off the podium altogether, while Hunter was unable to hold back the force of nature surge from Tomac. Coming off that perfect season outdoors, and still leading the Supercross points in his first indoor season with two wins. We really can't call Jet's mistakes typical for a rookie. Most rookies never experience crashing out of the lead, for starters. So let's say that Lawrence's atypical early errors are certainly prolonging the suspense of what could have been a much more linear series. After spending almost the entire race well in front of the field, it looked as though Jet would extend his points lead with his third win of the season. Jet got out front early, patted his gap back to second to about five seconds, and with that cushion, continued to seemingly manage the lead 
as we've seen him do so many times outdoors in his young career. Instead, as we have now seen multiple times in the tighter confines, he squandered his lead and the race win with mental errors that belied his young age. First, his lead disappeared when he jumped off the side of the track in a rhythm section that would be the undoing of many. Thankfully landing on that tough block instead of the cement apron as seen previously in the night. Not the worst outcome, but bad enough. He was able to quickly regroup and set off in hot pursuit of Cooper, who had just squirted past. But then, in his final run at Webb, Jet followed Vince Freezy, of all people, down the left side of the whoops. Parenthetically, Vince really didn't do anything more than holding his own line, the main racing line, as a lapper. It's still somehow amazing how Freezy can run someone's race without even trying. And not to forget, old Vince was maybe involved in Tomac going down early, and certainly in the mishap that took both Ken Roxon and Malcolm Stewart out of any contention for the win. From 5th on the first lap to 11 at the end, Vince Freezy again showed that he can be a rolling chicane wherever he is in the field. But no, the blame has to lie at young Jetson's feet. Maybe he was so intent on his entry that he didn't even see America's least favorite roadblock half a straightaway in front of him. In any event, when Freezy was still in the inside corner when Lawrence arrived, there was nowhere for Jet to go, except from first to fourth in just one lap. Hard pill for the kid to swallow, but still with the red plate. The antecedents of motorcycle racing at Daytona Beach predate the birth of Supercross, Motocross itself, and certainly the first super speedways of NASCAR. Early board track racing aside, and the obvious being that the first motorcycle race ever held likely took place as soon as the second motorcycle was even built. Racing at Daytona is nearly as old as racing motorcycles. Motorcycle racing has been a tradition at the beach since January 24, 1937, the inaugural running of the Daytona 200. The first race took place on a 3.2 mile beach and road course located just south of Daytona Beach. Ed Kretz of Monterey Park, California was its first winner, riding in an American-made Indian and averaging 73.34 miles per hour. That early race course ran approximately one and a half miles north on the beach, through a quarter mile turn where the sand was banked, and then onto a paved public roadway for the trip south. Coming back on the final turn, Another high sand bank awaited riders as they raced on the hard sands of the beach. Starting times were actually dictated by the local tide tables, as it wouldn't do to have the lapping surf overtake the course mid-race. The races continued from 1937 to 1941. In the early years, the Daytona 200 was also called the Handlebar Derby by local racing scribes. In 1942, the Daytona 200 was discontinued because of the Second World War. With the war came a general rationing of fuel, tires, and key engine components. Even though the racing event was officially called off, people still showed up for an unofficial party called Bike Week. On February 24th, 1947, the famous motorcycle race resumed and was now promoted by the legendary Bill France of NASCAR fame. Newspaper stories of the period recount that the city fathers asked townsfolk to open their homes to the visiting motorcyclists because all of the hotel rooms and camping areas were filled to capacity. And now for the thrills and spills of the Daytona races in the United States of America. Here the course consists of a two mile straight along the famous beach and a parallel straight along a metal road. The straights are joined at the end by banked corners where riders slide their machines and where also most of the spills happen. In 1948, 
A new beach road course was used due to ongoing commercial developments along the beach. Organizers were forced to move the event further south, towards Ponce Inlet. The new circuit measured 4.1 miles. The last Daytona 200 to be held on the beach road course took place in 1960. In 1961, the famous race was moved to the Daytona International Speedway. The history of Daytona International Speedway began in 1953, when Bill France realized the days of racing stock cars on the beach were numbered. Due to spreading land usage, the rapidly growing population, not to mention ever-growing race crowds. France put his plans for the future of racing in Daytona Beach in motion on April 4, 1953, with a proposal to construct a permanent speedway facility. The next year, France would sign a contract with the city of Daytona Beach and Volusia County officials to build what would become Daytona International Speedway, the world center of racing. In 1957, land clearing began for the facility. The famous 31 degree high banks were included in the design of the track, not so much that higher speeds could be achieved, but rather to make it easier for fans to see the cars race around the 2.5 mile trioval. The dirt from the banking was taken from the infield and resulted in a 29 acre space that is now known as Lake Lloyd. Racing moved from the Beach Road Course to Daytona International Speedway in 1989. The first Daytona 500 took place on February 22nd in front of a crowd of over 41,000. A past day, bright, clear, windless, race day. The sound of thunder in the clear sky is man-made. An Air Force salute of speed booming across 450 acres. 47,000 fans. The largest crowd ever gathered at Daytona wait for the fast cars to run. Our advantage. 22-year-old Petty has burned out his engine trying to keep up with the faster sedans. His dad, Lee Petty, fabulously fast in qualifications, holds back in seventh position, running for distance. Young Petty is finished, a victim of ambition. The race goes on. In 1961, the Daytona 200 motorcycle race was moved from the beach to the speedway. The following year, the facility hosted the inaugural running of what is now known as the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona. On July 5, 2013, ground broke on a $400 million front stretch renovation project that would transform the historic speedway into a state-of-the-arts motorsports facility. But that's about enough of this stock car nonsense. Let's get back on track. When motocross racing first came to the speedway, that's what it was. Motocross. In fact, motocross racing in the Speedway predates the National Motocross Series itself. In 1971, the Daytona race was a standalone, unsanctioned event. The 1971 racetrack was actually built across parking areas at the backside of the infield, but the location would be moved to Triable the next year, where it still is today. In 1972, Daytona races were held as part of the Florida Winter Am Series with AMA Pro Motocross only becoming a thing later in that year. Things that come full circle department. That first 1971 Daytona Motocross event was actually won by Gunnar Lindstrom, father of current team Honda manager Lars. Motocross, now dubbed as Supercross at the venue, has run at the Speedway in every year since, making it the oldest continuous streak 
for a professional motocross track anywhere. The 1973 race was not only still billed as moto, it served as the opening round for the sophomore season with the fledgling AMA Pro Motocross Championship. Yamaha had imported Dutch Grand Prix rider Pierre Carsmakers for the 1973 season, and Pierre left little time making his mark on American motocross. He won outright over his U.S. competition, winning not only his first 500cc national stateside, but also giving Yamaha what might be considered their first ever Premier Class win as well. In the 250 class, Bob Grossi on the Husqvarna swam upstream against the influx of newer and lighter Japanese machinery to take his one and only pro motocross win. The very next year, the scenery was the same, but the chase had changed. After having hosted the opening round of the outdoor season the previous year, the 1974 race would kick off the brand spanking new AMA Supercross schedule for its inaugural campaign. France had brought on Houston Astrodale short track TT promoter Alan Becker to start the new series. Neither might have dreamed that Supercross would one day be the biggest off-road racing series in the world. Cars makers sort of repeated his win from the year before and earned another first that day, Yamaha's first Supercross win. Supercross series was already veering towards 250cc machines, being more suited to the tighter confines of stadiums. So cars makers would switch from the open class, leaving the door open for visiting Belgian Roger de Coster, then a three-time world 500cc champion before going on to win five to take his one and only Supercross win. 1976 would mark the emergence of a cocky upstart kid from the rugged Southern California desert. Bob Hanna had stormed through the Florida Winter Am Series with an unprecedented wide open feet off the pegs approach to going fast. Leading almost as legendary Cycle News writer Jim the Greek Giannatis to dub him with the moniker Hurricane. Coming off a veritable sweep of the Winter Am events, with four successive wins in Orlando, Gainesville, Cocoa Beach, and St. Petersburg, Many thought Hannah would also steamroll the competition at Daytona. Pennsylvania Suzuki rider thought different. Hannah had been racing the 500 class and dropped down to the 250 for Supercross. The rider who had been just as dominant as Hannah in the winter aims, but already in the 250 class, was another rising star, the son of a motorcycle shop owner named Tony Stefano. Hannah crashed in each of the three motos. The Daytona format of the day. There's nothing new under the sun. And finished a lowly 10th overall. Tony D's 2 2 1 finishes were the winning formula. Handel would come back the next year with the Vengeance, winning Daytona along with Atlanta on his way to the 1977 Supercross Championship. Team Honda's rise to dominance had begun, however. And in 1978, the trio of Marty Tripes, Marty Smith, Jimmy Ellis swept the podium, giving us a reason to show this very cool win ad from Cycle News. That 1978 win for Tripes was the first of Team Honda's wins. Team wouldn't win another race at Daytona for four years. Then the dam broke open. California's Daryl Schultz, who had won Daytona the previous year on a Suzuki, had switched to Team Honda. His victory in 1982 marked the beginning of an 11 year run of the table for Red Riders. Bob Hanna returned to the top of the podium in 83, his second win at the Speedway, and would garner the final Supercross win of his career in Daytona two years later. The son of the track builder, David Bailey, won the 1984 race. Ricky Johnson took his first of two wins in Daytona in 1986, then won again in 88. Split by privateer Ricky Ryan, who though not a member of Team Honda, nonetheless rode his CR250 to the win in 1987. Which brings us to Jeff Stanton. Now, Eli Tomac is considered the king of Daytona. But Stanton once held that crown. 
a bulldog of a rider, who had risen to relative prominence campaigning Yamaha's Air Hammer YZ490 on the national circuit. Stanton had been recruited to be Johnson's understudy at Team Honda, but quickly became the man of the hour after RJ's career-ending wrist injury occurred some 90 miles west of the speedway at the Gatorback Cycle Park in Gainesville. Stanton won four straight Daytona Supercross events from 1989 through 1992. 1993, of course, marked the emergence of one Jeremy McGrath, who began his dominant run inside the stadiums of America. Not, however, at the Speedway. Kawasaki's workhorse Mike Kudrowski picked up where Stanton had left off and won three straight Daytona races from 1993 through 1995. If you need a point of reference on just how rough the Speedway Supercross was in those days, Kudrowski serves nicely. The future Hall of Famer won four national motocross championships, 30 combined national and supercross wins. But of those 30 wins, only five came in supercross, three of those in Daytona. And most said that Daytona, then still ran in the daytime, was too long and that the track was too rough for a supercross specialist. But McGrath would never win at the Speedway. The Daytona Supercross race was much different in those days. Different than it is now, and certainly different from the other races on the schedule. Yes, it ran in the daytime. Generally it was hotter and more humid than most non-Floridians would anticipate. And lap times were often closer to two minutes long. In the era of 20 lap mains, the Daytona Supercross sometimes took 30 minutes for riders to complete. Also numbering 30 were the riders in the main, with the Daytona round opening up 10 additional spots for aspiring racers. It was a grinding test of man and machinery. Something that is difficult to describe, it kinda had to be there, and I was, was the ambiance not just the Daytona Supercross, but North Florida in those days. Journeyman pros from the snow belt sofa surfing through the winter ends until the first week of March. Locals like me laughing in our helmets a bit when we passed those sometimes faster guys as they wilted in the Florida heat late in motos. The influx of name brand superstars, Stanton, Bradshaw, Bale, the lot, the local practice and private tracks and hidey holes we rode all year long. First came the Atlanta Supercross, then Gatorback, then Daytona the next weekend. And the Daytona 200 Road Race was held the very next day, not a week apart from the Supercross. So we'd have the outdoor opener at Gainesville, then it was off to bike week. I remember well the Suzuki semi being stuck in the trees at Jimmy Marchant's secret stash. Not to mention McGrath sucking the graphics off my radiator shrouds as he went around. Maybe Gatorback was the orphan national to the California boys of motocross action. Old men, even then. It was the culmination of dirt bike Mardi Gras for us locals. Anyway, McGrath couldn't win in Daytona. That was the talk. Then came 1996. Honda had won the 1978 race, then had that 11-year streak through the 80s and 90s, culminating in Stanton's 1992 win. Jeremy putting the Honda back in the winner's circle was the first of another five Daytona wins for Honda to come. McGrath would win again at the Speedway in 1998, 2000, but not on a Honda. Jeff Emig won his only Daytona Supercross in 1997, his championship year. The new millennium would welcome a new king of Daytona, as Ricky Carmichael made his presence felt in the premier class. Carmichael had struggled indoors on the 250, but he would take his first ever premier class win at Daytona aboard a Kawasaki. 
and that would be the first of his five Speedway wins in 2000. Carmichael also won the next three straight Daytona races, then again in his final season in 2006. In 2004, the entire schedule of Bike Week was shifted, and the Supercross was moved from a daytime program to the night. The atmosphere of the event forever changed. It wasn't just moving the Supercross to a night show. It was moving it away from the then biggest road race in America, the Daytona 200. Club and support class road racing took place at the Speedway throughout the week, leading into a weekend that featured AMA Supercross and AMA Superbike racing on back-to-back -back days. Most of us were there for the duration, suffering the wrath of surly security guards and soaking up the early March sun. Glorious days. With Bike Week revamped, Supercross was moved the week before the 200, which itself isn't what it used to be, alas. Due in part to lighting limitations, but also to continued infrastructure improvements in the Speedway infield, the overly long and rough race course began to shrink in size. The composition of the soil changed, with more and more clay being added to the mix. It's still sandy, but it's nothing like it was in the early days. Gary Bailey digging ditches with a backhoe and calling it a track. Telephone poles buried under the sand for wolves. Not everything back when was better, to be sure. Anyway, Chad Reed interrupted Ricky's run with back-to-back -back wins in 2004 and 2005. He would have had a third Daytona victory had his engine not expired at the 2008 event. Crowd favorite Kevin Wyndham was there to pick up the pieces and the win when Reedy's bike quit just a few turns from the finish line. Reed came back the next year to score his third and final Daytona win. Another hugely popular win for Honda came in 2018, when veteran racer and excellent race day live edition, Justin Brayton took his sole Supercross victory. James Stewart, who thankfully will be back in the booth on Saturday, can boast of the longest gap between Supercross wins with victories in 2007 and 2012. Ryan Villapoto won four races in Daytona from 2010 through 2014, interrupted only by Stewart's win. But the undisputed present-day king of Daytona is Eli Tomac. Eli first won at the Speedway in 2016, and has taken the victory there every year since, aside from Brayton's surprise win. Just like stock car icon Richard Petty, Tomac has seven Daytona wins. And County, one thinks. Fifty four races held at the Daytona Speedway, with fifty two billed as Supercross. Seven rounds into the season, the points race continues to tighten. By this juncture in the season, year after year, the foundation for some riders' championship has been laid. And we begin to see who's who and what's what in the chase for the title. Every single season it works out that way. Every season but this one. The gap between first and fifth after Glendale was just 11 points the closest the title chase had ever been at that point in the season. It's now widened by two, but 13 points after seven rounds is still the closest the points race has ever been at this point in the season. Ricky Carmichael, who designed the track this year and for the past 17, always says that the season starts at Daytona. A lot of what RC says on the broadcast doesn't compute, but to his point... The winner of the Daytona Supercross has went on to win the championship in 24 out of 50 seasons. As a caveat, only four of the last 10 Daytona winners have held form at season's end, and that's counting Tomac twice. Is it possible that Eli is just getting wound up? 
If Ryan Nunji was a diesel, Eli Tomac is a locomotive. Injury or no, few thought it would be seven races in before we'd catch a sighting of the beast mode. But after that charge last Saturday night, some questions seemed like a distant memory almost as quickly as Tomac ripped through half the field in Dallas. Turnaround points indeed. Jumping up from 7th to the top 5 of the championship chase, Eli erased 4 points from his own deficit. After Glendale, the gap between Jet and Eli was 17, and now it's down to 13. And, after languishing just inside or out of the top five during the early season swing, Webb is every bit in the thick of it now, just three points out of the lead, rubbing his hands in anticipation of arriving at even deeper and rougher tracks to come. It could turn out that the most important points gap isn't from Lawrence to Tomac, but rather that only two points separate former two-time champions Eli and Cooper. Jet Lawrence throwing away his third Supercross win was a big story. Cooper Webb showing every sign of being in this championship fight all the way to the end is a big story. But the biggest story of all was Eli Tomac. Slow start and all, up on the box in second, fifth in points, and only 13 in arrears. And now it's on to Daytona, where King Tomac reigns. The best Supercross season in history is about to get even better. And hey, if you like this video, please like this video. Maybe you could give the subscribe button a little nudge. Don't cost nothing. Meanwhile, thanks for watching this.